Julian Barnett of London welcoming you to Brompton Cemetery. This is a real treat of a place and that sound, might sound like a very strange thing to say, visiting a cemetery being a treat of a place, but it is and that's one of London's great pleasures, cemeteries. More on that later. I just want to take you over to um, give you a clue as to what this place is all about because Brompton, think of the word, as with so many place names, it's an English name that ends with those letters T-O-N. Ton, Anglo-Saxon word for settlement, it's where we get the word town from. And Brompton Cemetery comes from that word. This was the settlement of the Broom family, the Broom family that were an Anglo-Saxon family at the time of the Norman invasion, 1066. You will hear me making mention of quite a few of those um, things in future tours. Anglo-Saxons, William the Conqueror, it crops up again and again. But what I want to show you is something that most people would miss, and that is this. Because here we have the railings of the cemetery. We have, oh, I don't know, 1890s railings. We have um, 1890s, 1900, maybe a bit earlier, brick walls. But look at the bottom much, much older. And this shows that this was all part of the previous estate. So the cemetery was carved out of a previous estate. And these walls here are all that remain of that estate that was there prior to the cemetery. Such is the story of London generally, that London is a story of um, evolving estates, evolving properties, um, transfer of lands and properties from one group to another, sometimes due to invasion, 1066, other times due to law, sometimes due to disputes, sometimes due to legal sales. So here we now come through this very handsome archway. And I just want to point out some of these rather old notices on the walls. Cemetery is open from half past one o'clock on Sundays, Christmas Day and Good Friday and so on. And the public are permitted to walk in the cemetery daily. That might seem a strange thing to say, and let me explain why that is written there. It's written there because Brompton Cemetery, although it is a cemetery, is actually officially a royal park. The royal parks are parks such as Bushy Park, Regent's Park, Hyde Park, St James's Park, Richmond Park and so on. You're familiar with them. And Brompton Cemetery, although it is a cemetery, is officially a royal park. What makes a royal park? Well, a royal park means it's under the direct control of the Crown, which means access in and out and across that park is limited by the bylaws of that park. It is not automatically right of access. So Brompton Cemetery, built in the 1830s and onwards, was in fact built on royal land and it remains a royal park to this day. The other thing I wanted to point out was this. The Friends of Brompton Cemetery. How many countries would you have in the world where you have um, friends of a cemetery, societies built around cemeteries? And that is very much a reflection of the culture of this country. The idea that even in death, that even in cemeteries, you can have societies of people there dedicated to the study of the cemeteries, the upkeep of the cemeteries, the care and the appreciation, aesthetically speaking, as well as respect for the dead of those cemeteries. Now follow through a little further, because what I thought of doing today was simply pointing out um, a few of the graves in the cemetery um, and telling you a little bit about some of those. And I do want to say that although Brompton Cemetery itself is a pretty vast place containing um, 35,268 graves at the moment, and I say at the moment because you can still be buried here uh, if you have either a family plot or you have a particular reason to wish to be buried there and that you can argue your case with the local authority. But despite there being 35,000 odd graves in the cemetery, it is estimated that there are in, fa in fact 205,000 plus interments in the cemetery, and I'll say a little bit about that in a few minutes. Let's have a look at one of these graves. It is, as you can see, the family tomb of Benjamin Golding. This is a very handsome structure. It is actually grade two listed. I've mentioned listings before. A grade one listing, nothing can be done to it, exterior or um, interior. Grade two, um, it might need some repair and alteration inside, but the exterior really has to be kept as it is. 
Um, I did mention a fact in um, our tour um, of the red telephone box that there are in fact only two grade one listed graves in the whole of London. They are Karl Marx in Highgate Cemetery um, and Sir John Stones' grave in St Pancras Old Cemetery. And I asked the question why that's the case. Um, the answer to that little quiz question is because the vast majority of the really key graves in London are in fact within already existing buildings that are grade one listed. So for example, Westminster Abbey has the graves of a number of monarchs. So they are within a grade one listed building, Westminster Abbey. Um, so those graves that you could swear blind should be grade one listed tend to be within a wider grade one listing. And therefore lots of other graves that you would think would get that listing tend to be grade two or otherwise. Let me tell you a bit about Benjamin Golding. Benjamin Golding was born in 1793. He was the youngest of 19 children. Um, and he, a number, with a number of his other siblings, became a doctor. Um, and he then married, come round here, he married his one and only love, Sarah Pellerin. Now Sarah Pellerin was a very unusual lady for her time. She was a canny businesswoman and in fact she owned a number of businesses. The most important of those businesses being a perfumer. And in her perfumery business that was able to produce enough money to be able to pay for Benjamin's education. He became a doctor, University of Edinburgh. He then worked in Edinburgh. He then came down to St Thomas's Hospital London. In the end, he actually um, was one of the founders of, as you can see here, Charing Cross Hospital. Um, and he dedicated his life to the service of the poor. Um, and that is where he felt his calling was. He was able to do that partly because his wife was able to keep that family going. Real tragedy to this family, um, Benjamin and Sarah had nine children, all of whom predeceased their parents. Children predeceasing parents in the Victorian period, of course, was not unusual. But for all nine to die before um, their parents, that's a particular tragedy. Onwards to another one. Walking along, you can see, let's get a long view here, you can actually see the actual stretch of the cemetery. It's a beauty. Let me say something about the great cemeteries of London and why they came about. 1832, there was something called the London Cemeteries Act. And there was a desire by the authorities to, in fact, um, really revamp the way this country dealt with its dead. Now, there were two reasons for that. Reason number one is that there were just too many people dying to bury them in small parish churches. We're talking about the population of explosion of Victorian England. There were too many people dying. They couldn't keep packing them in layer upon layer upon layer in little parish cemeteries. So there had to be a move to move them out of the parish uh, cemeteries and into much bigger cemeteries. In other words, what I'm saying is a lot of those parish cemeteries were literally bulging at the seams. When there were floods, we have lots of accounts of the remains of people literally bursting out of the sides of cemeteries into the roads. It was a pretty ghastly affair. So the decision was taken in 1832 to set up a group of, I suppose, satellite cemeteries all around London, and they are sometimes now called the Magnificent Seven. To the north, Highgate Cemetery. To the south, Nunhead Cemetery and Norwood Cemetery. To the east, um, you've got Abney Green Cemetery and Tower Hamlet Cemetery, and to the west, Kensal Green Cemetery and this, Brompton Cemetery. These were the satellite cemeteries around the edges of London as it was then. Now they're sort of central almost. And quite literally, millions and millions of remains of people were taken out of the parish cemeteries all around London, of which there were hundreds, and of each of which contained many thousands of graves that had been building up over the centuries, and they were reinterred in these new huge cemeteries in massive unmarked plots. And then those new cemeteries then started to build upon that and bury people anew, fresh people dying, so to speak. So that's the real story of how these cemeteries came about. The second reason why it came about is that growing awareness about sanitation and about public safety. In another of my talks on Embankment Gardens, I talk about the great Joseph Bazalgette. And Joseph Bazalgette was one of the builders of the London sewer system. That's all part of this gradual realisation that we had to improve the sanitation and the health of the nation. And the building of this necklace of cemeteries around London was essential to that idea. Let me now move across and show you 
two more um, graves. Um, one is a chap by the name of Foy. Foy is very interesting. Let me just see if I can spot him. There he is, Tom Foy, Tom Foy. Now, Tom Foy was an interesting one. You can see there, um, Tom Foy, the comedian, the beloved husband of Ernestine Foy, who died in 1917 um, and fortified with the rights of the Holy Church. I want to say something about Foy. Foy um, was born in Birkenhead, up north, and he was um, trained, like most working class boys at that time, in a trade rather than a profession. And he became a poster drawer and he became um, a person that would literally draw the adverts for businesses and so on. He had a real skill in that and it soon became clear that he was slightly wasted in the small Birkham, uh, Birkenhead business where he was working. He decided to join the circus and to paint the scenery at the background to circuses, which he did with great aplomb. But there was another talent there because once he was in the circus painting away, his um, comrades in arms at the circus discovered that he was a very, very funny man. And he became a performer in the circus and a clown and a joke teller and a singer. In fact, to cut a long story short, this man, Tom Foy, was a jack of all entertainment trades and he was able to pull in the crowds. He moved from one circus to another until he became a really successful circus performer and then moved on to the music hall. And that is how he spent the rest of his life, leaving quite a fortune. There was a problem with it though. His wife, who was a very religious Catholic, felt that he had forgotten his roots, his Roman Catholic, Northern English roots. So she insisted as he lay dying that he um, reconverted to the Roman Catholic faith, that being a lapsed Catholic was not the way that this man should die. Thus those words, fortified with the rites of the Holy Church. He took his faith on again before he died. But he was meant to be an absolutely spectacular performer, self-taught, self-trained uh, and self-made. But this cemetery is varied. So we go from medics and comedians to leading political figures. Look at this one. This one is possibly the most famous grave in the cemetery. There she is, Emmeline Pankhurst. One of the most famous suffragettes, born in Manchester, but spent most of her life campaigning out of Manchester down here um, in England. And you can see there that there are always tributes to her, votes for women in that suffragette colour of purple and white. Purple and white flowers there, suffragette colours there. There's always little tributes for her there. It's really a very moving spot. In all my years of coming to um, Brompton Cemetery, I've never actually not seen there being something there. On certain days of the year, there are, you know, quite big gatherings of people there um, making tributes to her. And you'll remember that I have actually talked a little bit about the suffragettes in another tour, or if you've not seen it, tune in and have a look at it, my tour of St Giles Circus, where I talk about one of Emmeline Pankhurst's um, most esteemed colleagues, Emily Davidson, who died under the King's racehorse. Have a look at that one. It's a tragic and interesting story. But Emmeline Pankhurst, as you can see, was buried under a Celtic cross. That was the decision taken, uh, what would be most suitable to her beliefs and to her approach to life. Uh, and always a lovely place to visit. We're now going to continue up the central part of the cemetery. And I'm going to point out a couple more graves to you. Um, but if I can emphasize, this is a taste. Like all of my tours, there is no way I could really give you a, an exhaustive tour of Brompton Cemetery. There is so much. Look at those tales I've just told you about one medic, um, one entertainer, one political activist. Every single one of these graves tells a story. And like I will say with all of my walks, I'm giving you the introduction, you follow it up yourself. So we move on and I'm going to lead you to a very intriguing place. Follow me through the greenery. And here I am in front of what has to be one of the most impressive tombs in the cemetery. It's impressive for a number of reasons. It's huge. Whoever built this had a lot of money. 
It's of an interesting design. It's not unique. There are a number of graves of this design in the cemetery, but you can immediately get the idea of what this is all about. This is all about ancient Egypt. You've got this trapezium shaped door. You've got um, this uh, cornice at the top with sort of fake hieroglyphs because none of it actually makes sense. I've actually come along here with um, an hieroglyphs expert from the British Museum. And although there are some hieroglyphs that are correct, it's all about conjuring up the, the feeling of hieroglyphs in ancient Egypt. The third reason why it's of particular interest is that we do not know who is buried in this place. Nor is there a key. There's the keyhole, but the key is long lost. I want to take you to the keyhole because can you hear the echo? It's a huge place. And we know that there are two coffins in it. And the reason we know there are two coffins in it is because, of course, there are records to this cemetery. Every person that's buried in this cemetery above ground, remember, of the 35,000 odd people that are buried above ground, there's 205,000 people buried in layers below that we know nothing about. But of every person that's buried above ground, there is a record of who they are. We know that there were two coffins here. We know it was a person of substance that built this tomb. But we do not know who that person was. We do not know why that person built the tomb um, in this very grand um, evocation of the Egyptian style. Um, and we do not know really what it's all about. There have been the most fantastical things written about it. Just prior to us coming here to film, there were some people sitting here. Um, and I asked whether it's possible if we can just film here, and they very kindly um, let us do so, and, and, and they, they removed themselves from this platform where they were sitting. And one of them said to me, ah yes, this is a time machine. And it's absolutely true, this has been one of the sort of myths that have grown around here, that this is somehow uh, made in a particular shape, particular size, in a particular way, aligned with particular stars. You know the sort of thing, there's lots of documentaries about this to do with the pyramids and so on. And that it's all aligned to certain things and that within here is some form of time machine. That's one of the stories that's, that has grown up about this. The answer is we know very little about it. Uh, but there has been much talk about opening it up and it will be done at some stage, but there is so much money and time spent on the upkeep of this cemetery, it's not exactly high on the priorities of the cemetery to actually go to the expense of cutting keys, to investigating and so on. It will be done eventually, I'm sure. What's also very nice is that it sits in its own little circular plot. So the person that built this knew what he or she wanted. And the person that built this not only built this tremendous structure, but also had these trees planted around because the way this cemetery was built was if you were off the main pass of the cemetery, you would often be asked in part of your cemetery plot to pay for the plantage around the plot. So it's an interesting one. The mystery remains, um, but it's a great one to come and visit. On the theme of Egypt, follow me because I want to show you something else. We've mentioned in previous tours that Egypt was a recurring theme in and around London. Now we've mentioned about 1922, which was when the tomb of Tutankhamun was discovered. So Egypt was really uh, on people's minds then, Tutmania as it was called. Anything to do with Tutankhamun, anything to do with ancient Egypt was done. Um, but there was a first wave of Egypt craziness, and that was in the 1800s. I'd like to show you the grave of a really important Egyptologist, an early Egyptologist. Um, as you can see here, he was way before Howard Carter. This man was from the 1850s, and here he is, Joseph Bonomi. Um, let's have a look here. Four children, in memory of four children who were called out of this life into a better in the Easter week of 1852. These are the children of Bonomi. Who was Bonomi? Joseph Bonomi, sculptor, traveller and archaeologist, born October 1796, appointed curator of the Sir John Soane's Museum, 1861. If you've never been to the John Soane's Museum, you've got to get there. Future broadcast for me from the John Soane's Museum, one of the great small museums of London. The quality of the stone is really fine. It's beautifully proportioned. The writing is nicely done. Everything about this is understated quality. And look down here. Here you can see the real stocks in trade of Bonomi's um, 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 learning and scholarship. You can see Anubis, the dog or the jackal. It's always a canine creature and Anubis was 
the god of mummification, sitting on top of, I don't know, a canopic vase or something, a sarcophagus, something to do with something that is mummified in ancient Egypt. And on the top, you've got a mixture of the Christian cross and the Ankh, A-N-K-H, one of those signs of ancient Egypt. It's a whole mishmash of symbols and ideas that very, very much reflects the age that Bonomi was in. This fascination with the East, as Egypt was, this fascination with ancient Egypt, and so perfectly um, situated close to the previous tomb we were with. Of course, this tomb predates um, the very large um, pharaonic tomb that, I, that we just visited. So I would suspect that the man buying the plot of land there for that vast structure wanted somehow to be buried next to one of the greatest Egyptologists of the time. And just behind it, on a completely different tack, I wanted to show you something else. Follow me. It's a chapel just in the middle of an open cemetery. So again, somebody went to the time and the expense of building for themselves a high altar, complete with tiles as if it was an altar. Um, looking at these tiles, it's Gothic Revival, 1880s, I'd suspect. Am I right there? Um, 1871, there we go, and 1873, so almost at the 1880s. It's almost in the Pugin style that inspired um, a, a Pugin, um, um, who built um, the uh, Palace of Westminster, the Houses of Parliament, the great Gothic revival in Britain in the mid to late part of the Victorian period. Now, I know nothing about the people here. I don't claim to know anything about these people, but it's just a fantastic um, example of that Gothic revival style because, uh, to make the point, um, cemeteries in London, where so much of the money was, cemeteries everywhere, but particularly cemeteries in London, are an absolutely unrivaled way of really finding out what was going on in societies from the point of view of architecture, aesthetics, um, belief systems, tastes in what people consider to be good taste, bad taste, and so on. It's a really good snapshot, Brompton Cemetery and the others, of England at the time when the cemetery was first brought into being, 1832, all the way through to burials going through to this day. Let's move on to two final sections in the cemetery. Follow me again, please. It's a beauty. It's unnamed, but it's from the arts and crafts period, so round about 1905, 1907, 1910 maybe. It's copper with the most beautiful wrought iron work um, put all around the structure. Um, but it is uh, a reference to many previous um, styles. So it looks almost like a medieval reliquary, um, but it's somebody's grave in the shape of a reliquary. Um, there is very little on this structure, but it's really beautiful. Um, there is nothing else like it in the cemetery, and I couldn't pass through the cemetery without um, letting you have a quick look at it. And finally, there are many people that we have looked at that are buried above ground. I'd like to show you the alternative form of burial in this cemetery. Brief detour, couldn't resist it. On the way to showing you uh, the underground section, you can guess what sort of person was buried here. A sailor, of course. General Alexander Anderson, Royal Marine Light Infantry. So worked on the boats with weapons. What is his grave? Just a load of cannonballs. I think it's just, well, it's just fantastic, isn't it? The final thing I'd like to show you today is the catacombs of Brompton Cemetery, because I'm sure you're now getting the idea that Brompton Cemetery, along with the other great cemeteries, Highgate, Abney Green, Kensal Green, um, Nunhead, etc. These cemeteries had various forms of burial. The vast majority of people in these cemeteries have no place to mark their final resting place because they're buried in huge heaps underground. Some people are buried in very grand mausoleums. Other people are buried in more humble graves. Um, some people were cremated and their ashes were kept in urns and those urns are in buildings called columbariums from the ancient Roman tradition of pe keeping people in urns in buildings of that name. The other thing that uh, Brompton Cemetery has is um, 
this, and this is its catacombs. Now, once or twice a year, the catacombs are open, and I'm going to take you down these steps here, just to give you an idea. Look at these wonderful gateways. These go down to a large underground system of rooms. Within those rooms, there are shelves, and on those shelves are masses and masses of coffins. Normally family vaults, normally where people um, are put in um, by request, they pay extra, and families on the anniversary of their death each year would visit them um, in the catacomb um, where they had been laid to rest. The catacomb structure of Brompton Cemetery um, is extremely extensive. We're talking about round about 6,000 people interred in the catacombs. If you just get a sweep, you can see the size of the catacomb building going all the way up, round to that round part, you've got the chapel at the top there, and all the way around here again. Again, it's something I would strongly recommend you to visit one day, the Catacombs of Brompton Cemetery, one of the great necropolis wonders of London. And now to the exit, via a little hump. Not only does every stone tell a story and every mausoleum tell a story, but in fact some of the trees tell a story. The tree over there is quite interesting, because underneath that tree is just a hump of soil. And that tells a story. In the 1880s, the famous or infamous Buffalo Bill came over to London with his Wild West show. He performed at Earl's Court, which is just round the corner from Brompton Cemetery. He brought with him a whole group of Sioux Indians who performed to the ordinances, uh, Indian rituals and, and uh, Indian traditions. Very, very sadly, those Sioux Indians actually died, almost every single one of them, because they picked up viruses in London that they had no uh, ability to fight. And they were buried in the very nearby Brompton Cemetery. Those bodies remain there until 1997, when finally, at the end of many years of legal actions and requests, their bodies were disinterred from this cemetery, taken over to South Dakota, and reinterred in Pine Hills, where their bodies are to this day. But isn't it remarkable how many stories there are to tell in cemeteries like this, where even beyond the stones there are tales of human endeavour, human sadness, human suffering, and just remarkable stories to recall. So I hope you've enjoyed today's walk around Brompton Cemetery. We've scratched the surface of it, but what I've tried to do today is to make that lesson again about London that there are many different ways to enjoy London. There are the paying ways to enjoy London. There are the obvious ways to enjoy London. There are the familiar things to see around London, but there are also sometimes to do the less familiar, or you do the familiar, but turn it on its head and find out another way to really view it. Now, Brompton Cemetery is a great example of that. There is something, sounds like a strange thing to say, but there is something for everyone in Brompton Cemetery. And I would urge you to have a look around yourself explore it. Um, it's a terrific resource and a terrific way to enjoy a beautiful spring day like today. Brompton Cemetery and the other great cemeteries of London are there for your enjoyment. Thank you for watching.